The entire world has been terrified of one thing ever since Russia invaded Ukraine. What precisely would happen if Vladimir Putin chose to press the red button? Let's look at it. 2400 hours before the launch, NATO has been under threat from Russia for weeks to stop supplying Ukraine with arms and ammunition. A convoy of NATO trucks is attacked by two Russian Su-25s just inside the Ukrainian border, leaving no one surviving. 2300 hours before launch, the US president has finally received confirmation of the convoy's destruction. Modern weapons were safe when they were outside of Ukraine, but as soon as they crossed the border, Russia designated them as legitimate military targets. The US president has since organized a secure teleconference with the leaders of numerous NATO countries. Russia continues to uh, has chosen to escalate in Ukraine. 1924 hours before launch, the U.S., Great Britain, France, Spain, Norway, Germany, and Poland all pleaded to Article 5 of the alliance. A strike on one is an assault on all. After a protracted and contentious deliberation, some NATO nations, including Turkey, have grave concerns because the incident did not take place directly in NATO territory. 200 hours before launch, combat jets put on alert for exactly such a scenario had already been flying for the past half hour the five states decided to give Russia a clear message. Numerous Russian military sites in Kaliningrad, Ukraine, and even along the Russian border itself are lightning striked by the force of NATO. 118 hours before launch, Russian defenses are utterly outmatched by NATO aircraft as a result of NATO's huge counterattacks. To avoid hitting Russian army concentrations, the attack targets are supply and fuel deposits, runways, logistical centers, and air defense installations instead. The targets were chosen carefully to prevent high deaths, since it is thought that the strike will be sufficient to dissuade Russia from further aggression. Oh, 19 hours before launch. Few military losses have resulted from the ensuing confusion, but significant vulnerability holes along the Russian border have been created, inviting more NATO airstrikes. Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, is ready for this, though. Nuclear weapons are his final card, the one thing preventing NATO from going full force. Oh, 13 hours before launch, an RS-12M1 Topol M-ICBM unit has received a single launch command. The crew just needs a few minutes to confirm the order and complete the final checks for launching because the missile is already resting in an elevated launch position. Launch. A succession of tiny explosive charges rips off a nuclear bomb's top cone and the enormous missile subsequently implodes into life. It's heading towards an American carrier strike group that is now traveling south of Japan, not a significant city. With the single tool at its disposal against the military superpower, Russia hopes to teach the US a lesson. 0015, the huge thermal signature of a gigantic rocket launching into the skies detected by a satellite of the United States space-based infrared system only 15 seconds after takeoff, the satellite instantly establishes a connection with many American Milstar satellites and transmits a flashing signal to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado and other units throughout the whole U.S. Missile Defensive Network. 0025, several American Warning System satellites are spotting a huge intercontinental ballistic missile signature thermal plume as it breaks past cloud cover. 0030. The Russian missile is presently traveling at a steep angle towards the upper atmosphere. This suggests a strike far closer to Russian coastlines than the American mainland, according to satellites that are monitoring the situation. As it should be going north to pass over the Arctic Circle, the missile is likewise headed into the incorrect direction for a strike in the U.S. 0115, the missile launch has been brought to the attention of the U.S. President. Additionally, new data shows that this missile is not being launched toward the American heartland. One can only hope that this surprise missile launch with a fake payload is only a show of might. The missile's trajectory, though, puts Japan and the U.S. facility in Guam in danger. 0145, every deployed carrier strike group and military leadership in the world receives an emergency alert through Milstar satellites. Guam and Japan both turn on their ballistic missile defenses when the Japanese Prime Minister is informed of the danger. 
However, given the missile's trajectory, it is extremely improbable that the Japanese islands will come under attack. Guam is a suspected target, but so is a transistory carrier strike group that is now performing normal freedom of navigation drills as it travels south of Japan and towards the South China Sea. There are only a few minutes for the U.S. carrier, if it is the target of the attack, to get ready to defend itself against a nuclear attack. 0233, the ships in the squadron are instantly instructed to spread out and put much more space between one another than usual. The carrier's deck is ordered to be cleansed of jets, and they are hurried underneath. Teams of damage control have also been told to gather. 0641, the missile splits the payload delivery vehicle from the triple stage rocket around seven minutes after launch. Four warheads are launched as this now rips open a cloud intended to throw off American radar. Only one of the warheads is active. The other three are decoys that were carefully created to attract inceptors so that the active warhead could strike its target. 0643, the American satellites measure extremely minute differences in the four warheads to distinguish the genuine from false using classified sensor technology. 0833, the warheads are lit up from underneath by the powerful Spy-1 radar of the Aegis cruiser as they start their final plunge down into the air. Several SM-6 missiles launch into the morning sky from the ship's deck. The cruiser is employing numerous volleys to increase its chances of a successful interception while taking no risks. Hundreds of sailors will die if they fail. 1015, there is no way for the battle group crews to determine whether they have destroyed a real warhead or just a fake one 60 miles below the two approaching warheads. All have already been instructed to brace themselves for contact and damage control teams are ready to tackle any flames as well as hull leaks and water right away. 1020, an enormous fireball erupts 3,000 meters over the water somewhere south of Japan 10 minutes and 20 seconds after launch. Satellite sensors are momentarily overwhelmed by a wave of electromagnetic and thermal radiation that is released by the powerful explosion. These electronic eyes in the sky start searching feverishly for signs of the strike group as the boom gradually dies down. The first radioactive emission is mostly safe for the members of the strike group because crews have been instructed to stay below decks. This is made possible by the strike group's proximity to the nuclear explosion's most deadly radius. However, if Russia had fired more than one missile as they would in a real effort to sink an American carrier and her accompanying escorts, the situation could have been much worse.